We recently visited USC's Institute for Creative Technologies, where Paul Debevic, who leads its graphics lab, has worked for over a decade on techniques to digitize actors and create photorealistic humans for both film and video games. Paul and his team also invented the Light Stage, a system that can capture high-resolution, three-dimensional models of people's faces in any simulated lighting condition. So, Paul, this is this is a Light Stage. This is Light Stage X. We've kind of been building these things since about the year 2000, and uh, we're finally starting to get a couple parts to work at this point. Right, and um, this is one version of it. We saw in the other lab a larger, the very first one that was built. What was the concept behind that, and what were the kind of requirements you wanted out of that, that needed that kind of rigging? Well, the big one, Light Stage 6, was designed to light the whole human body so we can digitize you in 3D, so we can record you with multi-view video, so we can relight you in post-production. Hmm. And that one is 26 feet wide. It has about 6,000 LEDs on it. This one here is actually smaller, but much more advanced technology. We've started building our own circuit boards, choosing our own LEDs, placing all of our electronics components. I'll introduce you to some of the team that does all of that. Um, but this has about 20,000 LEDs on it, and it's just for scanning and lighting the human face. So all of those lights are focused right in on here, and we can record just about anything about you. Right, it seems like there are two important variables. You have lighting, and then also the capture technology, whether it's for stills or video. And both of those technologies have improved over time. You've built custom hardware for them. Uh, let's talk about just the lighting first, because that sounds like that's like the most important thing. You want even lighting yep. and very controllable lighting. What else is important for lighting? Well, the light stages are like the only devices in the world where you can control the direction, the intensity, the color, the spectrum, and the polarization of light coming from every possible direction. Mm. And they're designed primarily as a research apparatus to discover ways of how surfaces reflect light and how we can model them in computer graphics. But over the years, with different research papers and different technologies we've developed, there's about like five commercially useful things you can do with a light stage. And the one that the movie industry and the video game industry come to us the most for is to get very high resolution models of people's faces in a bunch of different facial expressions. Right, so having very flat, very even lighting allows you to capture data without uh, controlling the variables, while you can control as much variables as possible. But because you can control the lighting, uh, you can also do things like light field capture, right? And you can capture a subject from with every single possible lighting scenario. This is a good point. So light fields and reflectance fields are kind of duals of each other. Mm. And uh, I was uh, uh, fortunate to be uh, actively publishing in the field of computer graphics back in the 1990s when some of the, the seminal light field papers came out. And the light stages were inspired by that because light fields were about taking pictures of people with tons of cameras from lots of different angles. But then the lighting is just fixed. Like if you get a light field of somebody under one given light. Suppose you want to put them into a virtual environment, interact with them in VR. Well, the lighting is just stuck for whatever you capture them in. And by the nature of the light field, you're not supposed to add dynamic lights. It's not a polygonal model that you're just going to put a throw a shader on. Yes, exactly. So what we wanted to do was make it possible to relight light fields and to have them photometrically interact with whatever environment. Make it look like somebody is really there, even if you're putting them into a space station or putting them onto a beach or into a cathedral. That's a ton of information it's you're gathering. It really blows up. At one point in Light Stage 6, the big one, we actually shot a seven-dimensional data set where it was thousands of images of a person, every point in their walk cycle, every direction around horizontally, several cameras vertically, and every possible lighting direction for every frame of their animation. Wow. But that made it possible to take our friend Bruce from our laboratory and then insert this animation of him running into any place in the world and you can change the view on him and he will actually get lit the right way as if he was really there. So how does that information actually get captured? Because you, know, you can control the lighting, but the camera technology, it looks like you're using a lot of off-the-shelf consumer, prosumer camera technology. Yeah, we use a lot of different kinds of cameras here. And the ones that probably get the most use are our sports photography cameras. These are Canon 1DXs, full-frame mm -hmm. sensor. And we chose those because they can shoot about 10 frames per second. 
when we're capturing a 3D model of somebody's face, the imagery that we use actually plays with the polarization of the illumination and the directionality of the illumination. And we want to take about 20 photos of people. Wow. Now, when you're recording a person, this is a living subject, they're always moving around a little bit, and you want to pretend that all those photos were taken at the same instant of time while they're making you know, a given facial expression. Yes. So getting through those photos in two seconds is really important, and having it very high quality to the point where we can discern tenth of a millimeter detail is important. So that's why this piece of equipment is on here. So it's, it's resolution, yep. it's frame rate, um, the shutter speed is fast enough for the lighting now. Um, we also care about dynamic range, yeah. Absolutely, yes. We're big fans of capturing the most dynamic range that we can get. These sensors are really good for that. Sometimes we'll even shoot in high dynamic range for certain kinds of data sets where we'll take long exposures and short exposures and merge them together with the whole HDR thing. Um, we even, on these cameras, we put Nikon lenses with special adapters onto Canon cameras. And these Nikon lenses were made in the 1980s and they're very manual. And as a result, we can go even faster because the apertures don't automatically contract uh, and uh, come open again for every right. single shot. They're just fixed there. Now we also put other cameras onto the stage like this one here. This is a Vision Research Phantom V341. High speed camera. And I think uh, this would not be unfamiliar to uh, Adam at all because I think a lot of explosions get Absolutely. recorded in various other uh, forms. We like to use this because we can change the lighting on somebody thousands of times per second and record all of those different lighting conditions over and over and over on this high-speed, high-definition camera. And that enables reflectance field relighting, where we can record somebody in the stage doing something and then show them under a different kind of illumination after the fact. You can basically light somebody in post-production and it looks just as real as if you'd really lit them that way when you were filming. Wow, and so these are, I mean, these cameras didn't exist. Some of these cameras didn't exist several years ago when the original light stage was being built. And you see so you're talking about the cameras have been getting better. Your amount of control you have over lighting is more precise with custom lighting. Um, and then what, what's next? Like, do you look for light field cameras that can capture all information in one go as opposed to having to spend hours changing lighting? Absolutely. It, ha it has been quite an evolution from the first light stage, which I built uh, when I was a, a lingering postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley up in the Bay Area. And the very first light stage had one light source. It was a, a 250 watt spotlight. And we built a mechanical mechanism that pulling it on ropes, it would actually rotate around in a spiral. And over the course of a minute, it would light you from every direction that light could come from. And we've um, slowly evolved to having more light sources. You know, once bright white LEDs were invented, we mm -hmm. started building spheres of those. Once new color LEDs came, we started adding those to the light sources. We'll show you some color LEDs in a moment. And what we've done on the big light stage six is we've actually essentially put cameras all the way around so that we're simultaneously capturing light field data and light stage data at the same time. Can we take a look at what someone looks like or what's yeah, the object looks like? Yeah, I think actually like? there's just enough room we can go in here and take a look at some of the lighting environments we can do. And we'll ask the amazing Jay and Xu Ming to help lead us through a little bit here. I'm going to give you a prop and we can look at some of the illumination. And you can just come on all the way in here. So this is the third generation of light source that we've uh, developed. These are circuit boards that are designed by the amazing Xu Ming Yu, who works in our laboratory, and he's running us through these patterns over here. Many of the models are processed by Jay Bush using software that's developed by Graham Fife, so this is very much a team effort that we have in the laboratory. And we're currently being lit by all of the white uh, LEDs. Now these mm. LEDs are actually um, behind polarizing filters, and every other LED is polarized either horizontally or vertically. So I've asked Xu Ming to turn on just every other LED. These LEDs are all polarized horizontally. Mm -hmm. And then when we switch it, it goes to polarize vertically. And so Xu Ming, switch it back and forth a little bit. Uh, we can't see it right now, but we've put a special polarizing filter on the camera that's right. filming us. And as Xu Ming switches back and forth, the shine off of the sphere and also the shine off of our skin should actually be switching on and off. And when we scan the actors who are in here, we want to separate those reflection components of the skin. Particularly, we want to really analyze the specular on its own, because that's our best record of all of the detailed shapes of every mm -hmm. little skin pore and fine crease that makes up an expression. And by changing the polarization and also the directionality of the light, 
we can analyze basically a surface orientation map of the face that's accurate to better than a tenth of a millimeter. It's completely different data sets. Yep, exactly. So if we can do things optically with the hardware, then we can make it a little easier on the software afterwards that has to analyze the data. But let's go through some other patterns that we have here. Uh, as you can see, we have red LEDs. Let's go through our colors here. We have green, yeah. we have blue, and more importantly than just RGB, which is enough to generate any color we could see, we also have other spectral illuminance, like the amber LED, which is a mm. spectrum that's in between red and green, and we have cyan here, which is a spectrum that's in between green and blue. So we can fill in some of those gaps in the visible spectrum, and we combine that with the white LED that we've got, we can actually generate, and sorry, I got a little bright in here. The, 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 uh, the Christmas ornaments look particularly festive at this point when you do this. Um, we can actually generate uh, something that can mimic the spectrum of any illuminant. We can actually mimic how tungsten light would look on you, or fluorescent mm -hmm. light, or daylight. And you can't do that with just red, green, and blue LEDs very effectively. When you're scanning someone's face, do you run through that entire spectrum, all the luminance? How long does that take? to get a scan. So when we use the sports photography cameras, a scan is about two seconds. Fortunately, most actors are pretty good at working with mm -hmm. their faces and they can hold it. And even if they move a little bit, we have some motion compensation mm. algorithms that will kind of line it up after the fact. We've got another process that uses actually uh, black and white monochrome cameras that can record directly to computer memory without having to click the shutter. And we can get that scan in about a third of a second. Wow. It was pretty fast. For one lighting scenario? Um, for Essentially, that's when we're getting a 3D model of the face, and we're Got trying it. to get a very high-res surface normal map and get the specular reflections separated from the diffuse reflections using the polarization. And that produces a 3D model of the face that you can then render mm -hmm. uh, in a game engine or in a VFX renderer under any lighting condition that you want. Right, okay. Now, the other thing that we do, and again, there's like five different things you can do with the light stage, is we can just literally light somebody with the light of a particular lighting environment. So if we go over here, thank you, right on cue. Um, and Jay, actually, hit the, hit the house light so that we can see this a little bit more pure just from the light stage here. So what we're actually seeing here, and you can see this reflected in these different spheres, this is the light of San Francisco's Grace Cathedral. And it is from a high dynamic range lighting map that I actually, you know, crossed the bay on, on BART when I was a, a postdoc at Berkeley. And I recorded this light in 1998. I did that by putting a mirror ball um, near the altar of the cathedral. And I photographed it at the time with a Sony VX1000 mini DV camera. It was like the only digital standard F camera I could get. But I wrapped it through the different exposures so I got the full range of the light from the stained glass windows to the altar to the, to the indirect light bouncing up from, mm -hmm. the, from the, uh, the, the wood of the, of, of, of the pews and the marble of the floor. And we're now being, you know, 18 years later, being illuminated with a light stage simulation of the light from Grace Cathedral. So recording the lighting environments for like a movie set, you're on set you to, to capture that data, to simulate it here, so then you can scan a model and then put it virtually back in that space to composite, the perfect composite. Exactly, exactly. And we have a couple more environments that we should be able to see here. Shuming can take us through. This is another classic um, lighting environment that we have, which is the, uh, uh, the Gallery della Uffizi in Florence. Mm. And you can see there's this uh, strip of kind of cloudy light above us. We're in between uh, two sets of uh, buildings which have columns, uh, kind of gray stone. Oh. And I made a computer animation back in 1999 that uh, used this as one of the scenes. And we did a simulation of some huge dominoes falling over. It was kind of an abstract interpretation of the conflict between Galileo and the church. And it ended up in St. Peter's Basilica. That's really trippy because just looking at the reflection, you can get, you can, if I wasn't aware that I was on the light stage, you yep. could convincingly tell me that we were between two buildings and this was a light source. Indeed, and more importantly, it, they're all radiometrically calibrated. So the light levels that we have on our faces, the directionality of the light, this mm -hmm. is the way we should look if we were actually there. Now, we're different materials, right? There's a material for our clothing, for the balls here, for faces. Yep. What works best, I mean? Well, the idea is if we get the lighting right, it should work for everything. Okay. Now, the caveat for that is that 
very shiny stuff like these spheres, mm -hmm. they are so shiny that you can still see the individual dots of the, of the LEDs. Yeah. On our skin, we have enough surface roughness that it blurs it all out, so you don't see mm -hmm. that roughness anymore. We actually had to build a different version of the light stage when we got asked to produce a scanner for consumer objects like sunglasses, because those have these textureless, very shiny surfaces if you put them in here, you just see lots of points of light. Right. So for that, Shuming and the rest of the team and I designed a special version of a light stage that had a strip of LEDs that would rotate around. And you take long exposures and the motion blur of that going around would give you continuous reflections. Wow. But we have a couple more lighting environments yeah. here. This one here I think was shot by some of our friends at the visual effects company Digital Domain, yeah. is that right? Yeah. And they're experts now at using these high dynamic range spherical images to light computer generated objects. So whenever they're putting a digital character into a scene, they're actually lighting that digital character with a record of what the light was like on set or on location. So it just drops in there and it just looks uh, completely believable. What does that capture tool look like on set? Is it just cameras? A couple ways to do it. You can actually put a mirror ball on mm -hmm. there and the reflection in a mirror ball reflects the full 360 degrees of the environment actually. You even see more than just the stuff that's reflecting on the front. Yep. You do have to bracket your exposures to shoot underexposed and overexposed images to get the whole high dynamic range series so you really know the intensity of light sources and indirect light in the same data set. Um, or another popular way to do it now is with uh, fisheye lenses, and you'll just shoot like fisheyes from three different directions, stitch those together like a panorama, and again, shoot that in high dynamic range. And we've just developed a new version of it that works with a single shot. It's got a couple of different mirrored spheres uh, and a couple of color charts for calibration that will actually tell you everything you need to know about the dynamic range of the light and about the different spectral qualities of the different illumination for the color rendition you're getting. I think we have one more lighting environment over here. This is a fun one for people from LA or fans of Terminator 2. Uh, this is the LA River. So you can see there's a, um, uh, a blue sky, yes. the sun's over there, and we're kind of underneath one of these concrete uh, bridges across the LA River. And you have to sort of imagine some truck driven by Arnold Schwarzenegger barreling down at you, fall, falling out of the bridge exactly. And in that blue sky, you can even point out where the sun would be. Yep, in, uh, absolutely. And I think actually, in this particular one, we're not overdriving the LEDs to actually do the intensity of the sun, so it's kind of a little bit more diffused than it really should be for this demo. But in some of our demonstrations, we actually will get the LEDs all in perfect radiometric alignment, so it really looks like, the photos of you really look like you're out in the sun. Can we take a look at what a human scan looks like? I think we should go and take a look, and I think Jay Bush will be able to show us that. Let's awesome. head on out. All right, house lights, please. The detail and complexity of the digital scans we examined from the light stage gives us just a small glimpse into how difficult it is to create the perfect photorealistic person, even with today's computer graphics. We often think of graphics in computational terms, image resolution, model geometry, or even rendering power. But it all starts and ends at something we take for granted in the real world, lighting. 